Tēnā koutou katoa, uh, no mau hari mai ki our farm, so hello everybody and welcome to our farm. My name is Jo Sheridan and I'm the demonstration manager here at our farm. It's, um, it's a real pleasure to host you all here today. A couple of things I just wanted to talk to you about is who, who's first time on the farm today? A few of you, great, welcome. Um, a few things before we do get underway is that the toilets you'll find are just off to the right by the palm kernel apron there, there's some toilets there. Um, we are hoping to get out on farm, weather prevailing. Uh, we've got sunscreen uh, and we didn't bring any umbrellas because we, we kind of want it to rain and get it over and done with so we can get our silage cut, but we'll try and um, alter our day so we can get out to the herd um, at some stage. Now the other thing is that we are going to be heading over to the shed, so while we're over there just make sure um, when you're in the shed that you're staying sort of away from the, the, the rotary platform and that you just watch yourself on, um, on the concrete surfaces, it's still a bit wet, freshly hosed down from AB this morning, so we just want to make sure we keep you safe while you're out and about on farm today. Uh, a, a couple of things, I guess, uh, in way of, of introductions with the, the wider team here today. So, of course, our farm is a joint venture between Lincoln University and St Peter's, so formed back in 2015-16. And uh, we've had over 10,000 visitors uh, over the farm during that time. And our, our biggest, um, I guess our mandate really is about demonstrating farm performance to create a sustainable future. So everything that we do here is about evolving in a balanced way that takes into account uh, farm performance, uh, our business health, taking care of our animals, taking care of our people and our environment in a way that our community um, values. And that's, that's really our mission and what we're trying to achieve here at our farm. And we can do that because of the partners that we've got on board, and we can do that because of our valued um, farm management committee team, which some of you are here today. So I just wanted to sort of make a few introductions um, before we get underway. So I'm just scanning the, the room across here. Um, we've got Grant. Grant's one of our farm management committee members here. Um, I did see Daniel at the back, Daniel. Uh, and Joe and Sarah Wood. <laughs> Who else have I missed? Uh, some of them might turn up again later and we'll make sure they are known to you today as well. Uh, the other couple of things I wanted to introduce, um, so Bevan at the back, Bevan Williams. Uh, Bevan is uh, from Go Farm Relief Services. He's been managing the farm for us for the last um, three months and he'll be talking to you a little bit when we're in the shed and um, you'll meet Jules as well. So Jules is our, um, our other valued team member. Um, and you'll get a chance to meet her today. So just wanted to thank them for getting today ready. Um, I hope you all agree the place is looking stunning. They've done a wonderful job getting everything tidied up and ready to host you all here today. So um, we really appreciate all the hard work that you've been doing, Bevan, and the team. So thank you for that. Okay, so... Um, what are we up to today? So today... Sometimes it feels in the world that everything's out of control, and today was really about talking, around, well, talking about the things that we can control, and um, our big first one for us was about milk quality, somatic cell counts, and how we extract value from the product that leaves the gate every day. So every time we have a tanker come in who takes uh, our milk away, we want to make sure that we're getting the most value we can for that milk. So we're going to have a session looking at other health, and we're also going to have a... So we've got Steve Cranfield from um, AgriHealth, thank you Steve, who'll be over in the shed with the group, and we've also got Michael Shalkris from Fonterra, who's going to talk a little bit about um, the cooperative difference and how the payments for somatic cell count are um, structured, how they're valued, and what some of the trends have been in that space. So that's one thing that we can control on farm. The second one that we're going to look at is um, time and task analysis. So we've uh, done a little bit of work on what our team is doing with their time, and that has informed some investment in technology. And we want to explore how that's worked out for us, what we've learnt from that, and we wanted to be able to share that information with you. We will head out to the herd. We've got one of the herds is just out in paddock one as you drove in. We'll take the time to uh, go through the herd, have a bit of a chat with what's going on at the moment on farm, and then we'll head back inside here. We were gonna talk a little bit about on-farm inflation, um, something that you've all been feeling, uh, and what we can potentially uh, do about it, what the projections are and what we can do about it on farm. 
And then we'll finish with lunch at one o'clock uh, today. So we'd love for you to stick around after lunch and catch up with any of the speakers that you've um, been able to catch up with. Okay, so let's get into it. So you're having your handout. Um, most of the, the graphs and information is in the handout. Um, if you haven't got one, go and see Kate. She'll be able to get one for you. And uh, what I wanted to do was just talk a little bit about um, some of the information from our farm before we allow you to break into groups and hear from some of our experts that are here today. So this is the cooperative difference. So who supplies Frontier here? Yep, quite a few of you, great. So you all know what this looks like. This is us for this year. Um, at the moment, we've supplied 121 days of excellent quality milk. So that's meeting both the somatic cell count and the FEI, FEI as well as the milk quality parameters um, from 130 days, so about 93%. We are targeting uh, Titihi, which is achieving 90% of um, quality, excellence quality milk, and we've already ticked off our extra seven cents for uh, um, the putiki, putaki, which is about um, supplying or meeting requirements around environment, people, and um, our animals as well, and also a cooperative um, and prosperity, which will be filled in by the end of this season. So that's what we're aiming for. Last year we hit 66% milk excellence. And that for us meant that we had an extra income coming in uh, of 11.5K for achieving the tipu-taki, which was our 7 cents per kilo. And we got an extra 3.7 thousand for meeting the excellence quality. So our aim really is to make sure we're maximising, like I said, the amount of money that's coming in for every kilo of milk solid that we're producing. Now, when we start to explore this a little bit deeper, this is from our Farm Insights report that you all would have received recently. You can see our farm sitting there. Um, 120,000 was our average for the year. Um, but what really surprised me, because we were really challenged as soon as we went into three and two milking, our somatic cell count went over the threshold and we just slowly lost day after day of meeting that threshold. And that's that balancing act we talk about. Three and two is a strategy to manage heat stress and it's also a strategy to reduce our hours and improve our quality workplace. When we looked at the, this information, this is Waikato farmers, um, and it really surprised me how big that range was because we thought we were struggling with this, but um, obviously we're not the only ones. And it made us really think about where's the opportunity in this and what we can all learn from this together. So that's why we're talking about it today. So there's lots of benefits of, of getting that somatic cell count under 100,000. And for us, it's worth about $8,000 at a $9.30 payout. So even for us, there's opportunity in being able to do this better. This is us over time, which I think is a really interesting picture as well. You can see that each year, there's two things that have been happening. One is that we've been able to reduce our late season tail, so we're not getting those really, really high peaks. Most of that tends to be around feed management and our dry off plan, so we're not having those low litres, high somatic cell count being produced late in the season. And then what you'll notice is that the actual dip or the lowest point is reducing each year. So we're actually getting our early season somatic cell count down lower, which buys us more days once we start our alternative milking frequency to still achieve excellent milk. But what's been happening to the Waikato region? Can anyone tell me what that graph shows? That's the lighter line. Any trend there? <clears throat> Doesn't look like much is changing, right? <clears throat> so, I think there's uh, things we can learn about this. So, um, if we look at our somatic cell count over time, uh, you'll see the, the one that starts off the lowest at the very bottom, and this graph should actually be in your handout on page 17. We've been tracking pretty similar to what we did last season. We started off a little bit lower, and we've been able to hold it fairly, fairly low. Now, our one claim to fame, which got destroyed today, was that we had done about 10 weeks without a case of mastitis, and Jules just picked one up. <laughs> 
So um, you can have a word with her when you get over to the shed about that. But um, I don't know, it's, 10 weeks is, is probably a pretty long time to go without a case of mastitis. And um, I don't know if you ask Bevan how that feels uh, when you're not having to deal with uh, hospital mobs, when you're not having to treat, pay for treatment for cows, etc., etc. It actually does make you feel pretty good about what you're doing. Now the other thing that aligns with this is that when we talk about the financial performance of the farm later on this after, today, you'll see that the only cost area in our business that did not take a, a huge jump was animal health. Okay? So you start thinking about the investment that we make in managing lameness, mastitis and all those sorts of things on farm is actually something that we can control and something that um, is going to be really important as we move through this period of high inflation on farm. Okay, so um, a couple of things around this. Um, we have been pretty aggressive with our dry cow therapy and our teat seal on farm. Um, we do any of our culturing via vets of, of cows that aren't um, responding to treatment. We've been pretty aggressive with our culling on high somatics and repeat offenders. Um, and we are, are able to do that because we have very, we're getting lower and lower in voluntary culling. Uh, we use machine tests, we change our rubber every, every uh, twice a year and we also do our, our teeth spray warrant of fitness. So these are all things that um, Steve and the team will have a bit of a chat to you when, we're, when you're over at the shed to get this sort of result. Um, and this final graph here is just uh, the mastitis cases, which of course is going to take a little bit of a blip now from flatlining all through August, all through September and October and, and finally it's the 17th of November and we've, we've got a case. Now that's enough about me. All I wanted to do was sort of set the scene about what we've done here at our farm and then I really wanted to take the opportunity for you to um, delve into these two topics a, a little bit more. And what we've got is we, we're going to split the session up. Uh, what we'll do is half of, of the group um, will go over to the shed with Steve. Um, now Steve Cranefield uh, is, uh, has had, had over 20 years of veterinary experience and the last six years primarily involved in mastitis management. So you might know him from, from Pure Milk. He was involved in, in um, getting that one set up, but now he focuses mainly on pharma and industry education, particularly around mastitis management. He's based in the Waikato and is still a, a technical vet within the Agri Health um, within the Agri Health team. And so He's going to take you through a bit of a session in the shed. We've got some cows lined up that are going to go through the platform and uh, be prepared. He'll probably ask you a lot of questions when you're out there with him. Uh, Steve's information can be found in your handout. So on pages 20 through to 22, there's a lot of really good information that you can read later when you get home. Um, and feel free to make sure you take pens with you and take notes in that as you go. Now that session will be about 25 minutes. And for those of you that will stay in the shed here, You'll be in here with um, Michael Shellcris. So what we're going to do while we're in um, got my stuff here, uh, what we're going to do while we're in the shed here is have Michael talk a little bit about somatic cell count and how the the payments uh, work within Fonterra, why it's really important for Fonterra and for us as farmers to extract the maximum value that we can from our milk. So uh, it'd be great to have Michael um, work with you on this side and then what we'll do after 25 minutes is that we're going to swap over and then when the hooter goes and then you'll go to the other side. So does that make sense? Nice and easy? It gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Michael. So Michael of course is a practicing vet as well and he manages the whole vet technical team within Fonterra that deal with all the animal wellbeing and welfare issues. But today we've asked him specifically to talk a little bit about um, mastitis and somatic cell count. Um, and we've also got Bill, who is our local vet too. So if Bill wants to give some insights as we go through today, that would be great. Um, and um, yeah, we're going to kind of play it a little bit by ear, keep it pretty um, informal. And if people want to ask questions as we go, uh, we can do that. Um, and I'll hand over to you, Michael. Thank you. That's sure. your forward and back. Yeah, oh, yeah, with the slides I suddenly, on. I suddenly thought that's quite useful. Yeah, yeah there you yeah, go. Good. Alright. Yeah, Alright, hello everyone. So um, this this is the list of things that Joe asked me to kind of prepare a talk about, but as she said, I'm I'm easy, like any questions that come up in them as we go along just, just shout out and we can talk about other things um, either either as we go or, or at the end. So um, I think the 
there's this question here about why does somatic cell count matter? And, and Steve will talk about the kind of the animal aspects of that. Um, but I thought I'd try and talk about more at a why does somatic cell count matter to Fonterra as a milk processing company. Um, so cell count is, is probably the only or the most consistently globally accepted measure of milk quality. Um, and it has some implications for, for animal health as well. So um, people, when they're trying to compare milk pools around the world, will go, oh, what's the cell count in such and such? And they'll go, oh, you know, did you hear that, you know, in America, the, the, they're allowed to have their cell count up to a million, and that's acceptable. And whereas in, you know, in, in the UK, it's, um, you know, in, in Europe, that, which is probably where the, the strictest um, regulations were initially set at 400,000, that's kind of the, um, the, the more globally accepted benchmark for, for acceptable milk quality. Um, so somatic, cell count, som somatic cells themselves are just cells that have come from the body of the animal. So they're the, the kind of the cells that line the inside of the udder, their white blood cells, their red blood cells um, that, that kind of come out into the milk as in the course of, of the milk being secreted, and then you can see here on, on the right, uh, you've got normal milk, which has got, you know, it's got some body cells, it's got a small number of white blood cells, that's a low cell count milk. Then when you have an infection or an inf inflammation, um, suddenly you get a, a lot of white blood cells there. So when we're talking about somatic cell count, when it goes up, that's usually because you're getting lots and lots of white blood cells coming in. Those white blood cells um, are, are kind of there to fight uh, infection, but they also contain a whole lot of um, enzymes like proteases that will digest pr or, or destroy proteins that are in the milk. So there is an impact by if you've got more more somatic cells in your milk, then the milk is less stable because it's going to start destroying itself effectively. Um, the, those enzymes that are secreted by the white blood cells um, will erode the proteins in the milk, and that's where you get an impact on flavour on uh, processability on shelf life, that kind of thing. So that's that's why a milk processing company would care about it. Um, there is a quite a big impact on cheese production. So uh, if you talk to the old school people from in the in the factories at Fonterra, they used to you know kind of in the 80s, uh, early 90s, think that there were times of the year where you couldn't make cheese. So so it's coming into that kind of that late season. Uh, they just go, no, you can't make cheese with milk at this time of year. Um, and they didn't really know why uh, until we started actually regularly somatic cell counting and, and bringing those levels down. Because when we first started cell counting, kind of early 90s, it, it was reasonably normal to give, have cell counts over 400,000. You know, that was, that was what people had been running with for years and hadn't, didn't know there was, a, there was an issue. But once they fixed that, suddenly they're like, oh, look, we can make cheese all year round now. Um, and the lower you can get the cell count, and we'll talk a bit about it later, the more cheese you can get out of the same amount of milk. Uh, UHT, so ultra high uh, temperature, um, that kind of uh, room temperature safe milk, uh, it's a reasonably high value product, but it's very sensitive to uh, milk quality issues, so any contamination um, increases the risk that you get a kind of a failure of batch processing there. Uh, so important from a, from a milk processing perspective, again, low cell count, um, milk going into UHT process is, is more likely to have a kind of successful outcome. Um, and then subclinical mastitis suppresses milk production. So if the udder has got some inflammation going on, it's going to be spending time fighting that inflammation or infection instead of uh, producing milk. So if we can lower somatic cell counts, we can actually get more milk from the same cows. How is the Waikato going? As, as Joe said, um, it's actually pretty stable. So this is, this is a graph showing um, kind of the cell count distribution of all Waikato farms supplying Fonterra last season. So I think there's about 3,500 farms in this graph. Um, we've got some people over there at kind of 370,000 for average, but on the whole, you know, we've got more than 50% of our suppliers have an average cell count less than 150,000. Uh, this season to date, it looks a little bit better, but that's because we haven't had the bad cell count times yet. Cell counts are just going to start climbing from here, but last month's cell count average was 145,000. 
looking at different ways, the similar graph to what Joe showed, um, the, the line is showing the average uh, across the Waikato, and then you can see the, the range is actually quite wide, either size of that, that spread, um, but very consistent year on year. Once, you know, once, once you're taking the average of 3,500 farms, it's, it's going to be pretty stable. Some farms will go up, some will go down, but overall it's, it's going to be about the same. Uh, and, and cell counts have been stable for about the last 10 years. Um, the, you know, there was this um, kind of rapid drop that we saw um, kind of mid-2010s, and then since then it's kind of plateaued at about 170,000. So year on year, the, the national average cell count is kind of 170,000 plus or minus 5,000 within that range. Um, if we overlay last year on top of this year, so th last year is green and I copied it across onto, onto last, this year is green, sorry, and I copied it across onto last year, you can see they're exactly the same, those, those curves. So no, no difference. So if, you, if your farm's gone up or gone down, you can assume that someone else has gone up or down to, to kind of balance that out. Uh, so from a production loss thing, so as, as I said, inflamed udders make less milk. It's not a huge amount. It's, it's, in New Zealand, it's thought to be 2.1% per doubling of cell count over 100,000. So it's not, it's not a big deal at an individual cow level. But if we took it across the whole country, if we were to drop out cell count average of 170 down to 150,000, that's 6 million more solids that we get. Um, and those calculations in New Zealand have been done down to 100,000. And, and the lower you get, the bigger the impact there is there. Um, I've seen some recent research out of France that went down to 50,000, saying there's still a benefit to go down to 50,000. Um, it's only one paper. I wouldn't, um, wouldn't worry about that. Uh, but, but definitely, there is a production benefit to an individual farm to, to, to getting down to that 100,000. Like that's, it's a big stretch, and we, we wouldn't um, necessarily encourage anyone to do that because of all there's, we haven't taken into account the kind of sacrifices and the costs involved in doing that. Um, but there is a, definitely a production benefit to lower cell count. Um, and then, as Joe said, it's, it's in the Insights report. You can have a look at, um, at where you sit at a kind of regional perspective, and there's some stuff in there about um, if you were to lower your cell count, what production benefit we think there would be for your individual farm. Uh, that. Uh, that drawing comes from the states, so they've calculated slightly different numbers because their cows are slightly different. Um, the it's, it is, I think, when you're trying again, when you're trying to make international comparisons, you probably do need to look at country-specific stuff because the, the cows and the way they're managed are so different, um, country on country. So cooperative difference. Um, I hadn't been going to talk about the pricing because I assumed that everyone was all right with that, but I am. I can do that if you want to. Um, what I was go going to talk about is the, the milk quality framework. So um, this, this got refreshed a few years ago. It's in your terms of supply. Don't worry about trying to read it here. Um, but, but I guess the, what, it's, what we're driving at with the cooperative difference, that, that um, three cents additional payment for um, excellent milk quality milk um, that's that this green column on the left here, so that's the things that go into making excellent milk quality. Um, the, the aspect of that that is relevant to today's conversation and probably the one that farmers want to talk about the most is cell count. Um, so it requires to, to get that, so uh, collections that have got a cell count below 150,000 qualify as excellence milk quality, and so those are the ones that are eligible for the additional th three cent payment. So um, I, I acknowledge that uh, it's hard to keep your cell count below 150,000 the whole season, and that's one of the reasons why it, it is assessed on a collect per collection basis, um, rather than uh, it, it, the previous version of the cooperative difference had it on a three monthly basis, and we were getting feedback from farmers who were saying, hey, look, I can do a month but I can't do three months. And so this was to make it, um, I guess, accessible for, farm, for those farmers that, because most farmers, if we think about kind of that sort of peak, peak supply time, sort of September to November, um, a lot of that period, they will have a sale count below 150,000, even if their average is, is quite a bit higher for the rest of the, of the season. 
Um, but because it's paid out on a per milk solids basis, that's also the time of the year when most of your milk solids, are you know, the, the, the big bulk of the milk solids come in. So um, it is useful if you're trying to work out what, what are the costs and benefits of, of dropping your cell count further on your farm to look at how many solids were eligible for that um, excellence payment rather than necessarily how many days, unless you're like Joe, who's aiming for Titihi, which is all about days of supply at excellence. So it, it's, there's a complicated balancing act here. Um, uh, so then impact on products and markets. So our milk is some of the best in the world uh, and it's in, that is very useful from a marketing perspective and from a sales perspective because it's seen as you know, high quality, low cell count milk, it's trustworthy and, and that means that people will buy it. But if we break that trust then um, it can take quite a while to earn it back again. And so. Um, it is important that we try to do things to kind of keep that milk quality at the at the high level that it is now, um, but even improve as as competitors move to improve as well. Um, at the moment, we've got we have, we've had this this hiatus over the last kind of three years with with COVID that we haven't had any international audit teams come in. But at the moment, we've got um, one of them's from Korea. I can't remember where the other two are from. There are three international audit teams in the country and at the moment and so they're going around going hey look you sell us this milk you say this is how you make it prove it to us and so they end up going on farm and you know New Zealand is pretty unique in the way that we farm um, particularly the degree of um, of time that cows are outside you know if you think about probably our nearest equivalent competitor is a kind of developed exporting dairy nation is Ireland and they still have their cows wintered inside by and large um, so um, so auditors come in and they go hey it's really cool the cows are outside and then they go into the shed and the cows there's no teat prep um, the cows are come in they're covered in dirt they're covered in shit and we just cut them and it blows their minds um, because they don't see how we can make milk as good as it is um, when in house systems that are common overseas, you've got to do that teat prep, otherwise you give all your cows mastitis. So because they're all they're coming in covered in E. coli from their barn or, or you know whatever. So it, it is the expe expected behaviour for from an international observer coming into this country would be that the cows come in, you clean the teats, you dry the teats, then you then you cut the teats, and so actually um, you know this is part of that building that reputation is that we're able to supply this excellent quality milk despite the fact that we do things weirdly and so it's important that we keep going hey look don't look at what we're doing look at the results we're getting which are this, this good milk that we're achieving and these low rates of disease that we get because our cows are um, not subjected to such uh, high environmental um, disease pressures. Um, Oh, OMARs, Overseas Market Access Requirements. So th those are really fun. Um, that is, when we talk about that 400,000 cell count from, from Europe, that's, that's an example of an, of an OMAR. So they, Europe has said, this is our standard, minimum standard for what is acceptable milk for humans to drink. You have to prove that the milk that you've collected meets our standard, otherwise you can't import into our country. And every country has got these things, and we've got them as well. So this, this is where you'll see non-tariff trade barriers get erected, is that they'll go, hey, we don't like something about the way you, you make your milk, we're, or we want to protect our own dairy industry. We're going to make these rules, and you've got to comply with these rules. And so some of those things that we're testing for here, we're, they're, not, not, they're not necessarily a quality um, metric from our perspective that they're being tested primarily for overseas market access requirements these are things that customers or markets have said you need to be looking at titratable acidity down the bottom that's it's like a really weird old-fashioned way of measuring things but that's how china um you know it's one of china's quality metrics that they use um there are i think more modern ways of of, of testing milk quality but that's what they want us to use so that's what we use um, so yeah, cheese. If we can get a cell count down below 100,000, um, we can make 1,700 tons more cheese. That's how much of an impact that low cell count has on cheese production. So um, I, th I think that's 
if, if you think about companies in New Zealand who have incentivized low cell count, uh, OCD were the first, I think. So that's because they're more interested in cheese production. You know, the, this, this cheese production is really important for OCD, um, and so driving cell count low is important for OCD. Um, UHT, as I said, susceptible to quality defects. Um, those other things, bacteria, sediment, um, colostrum, FEI, all impact the kind of plant hygiene, our plant hygiene, and so um, that if, if you've got lower quality milk, it means you've got to pull the plant apart and clean it more often. Uh, and then FEI, I, I can talk about this more freely than we could when we first introduced it now. Um, one of the concerns, so, so there's, there's two, two things that happened when we started feeding lots of palm kernel, and they both relate to the fact that the fat profile in a cow's milk reflects the fat profile of the food that she's eating. Um, the first thing that happened was that it got really hard to make butter at certain times of the year, particularly in Northland. Northland has got uh, the, the Kauri um, processing plant in Northland has the world's um, most advanced milk fat distilling machine. So what they can do, and this is how they make that spreadable butter, is if you think about how um, distilling of, I don't know, um, alcohols or petrochemicals or something works as you, as you heat it up and the the kind of the, the lighter elements float to the top and the heavier ones and you can draw them all off at different heights. So what they do with the butter there is they split it into all the different fats and then they recombine it in a, in a different, slightly different ratio to make it more spreadable. So that's how the spreadable butter works. Um, what they were finding is that they couldn't make butter. Uh, it was coming out all, all crumbly and hard and I've, I haven't felt it but I've seen pictures of it and it's pretty weird looking. Um, and so, so that was a problem, and you can see that reflected in Canada. Last year there was this scandal where people realised that their butter wasn't melting at room temperature anymore, and, and then it was all in the Canadian news, and it turned out it was because the Canadian dairy farmers had started feeding palm oil to the dairy cows in order to, to boost their milk fat production. Um, but it was that, that flow through was happening there. So that, that was one of the reasons why we, we needed to better regulate um, the amount of palm kernel that was going into cows. Future trends. Uh, what is coming? This is a picture, I, I did a Google search for future farm, and this was this picture of a future farm. I don't think that's a very good representation of a future farm. I think that this is. Um, so that is the building that we're standing in. Um, the things that are coming are, are all going to be about efficiency, production efficiency. So if we think about um, the commitment, the, uh, we were talking about emissions pricing, I don't want to talk about emissions pricing necessarily today, but um, the, the thing that is going to work there, and the thing that works in dairy's favour, and in particular our dairy industry's favour, is that we currently have a low emissions per kilo of milk solid that's produced, and what, our, what Fonterra's customers are wanting uh, is low em embedded emissions, so that kind of relative emissions intensity. Um, so anything that you can do to improve the milk production per cow, effectively, uh, or per feed input. And so that's where low rates of disease, low cell count, uh, low rates of involuntary culling, all these, all these good things that we've, al you know, we've always known these are good for, for efficiency, but there's now a much stronger driver to, to kind of push that. So that's, that's where I see the future being. Um, markets really like that we're low antibiotic users, but we could always be lower. The marketing people are always saying, oh, can we say no antibiotics? I'm like, no, no, you can't. Only, only the organic farmers can say that. Um, but there is, there's a, a lot of market kind of uh, desire to be able to say that. Um, and then, yeah, question around how low can the sale count go nationally? I, I think we're probably pretty close um, because you do start to get into a diminishing returns thing where you can put a lot of effort into your sale count uh, at, at a national level um, and, and not necessarily see much movement on the dial, as, as you see, we, you know, things haven't really changed for, for 10 years. But the, you know, the farm with the lowest cell count um, last year was 27,000 cells across the season, so it can be done. Um, <coughs> sweet. Thank you, Michael. All so right. Time for a couple of questions. Yes. Um, would they be to the state of sending tankers to separate farms that had low cell count milk and supply in factory the same? Yeah, it's, do they, do that or? they don't. Um, I mean, that was one of the other benefits with the FEI testing was was that what they were having to do with 
with the high FE, high FEI farms was actually send like split the milk up to because it because it was impacting the butter processing. Um, the difficulty that you have with um, any of those kind of special milk pools is you've got to set up the, the processing infrastructure for it. So at the moment where we're no longer scrambling to just build processing infrastructure to keep up with supply, um, it's the kind of thing I could imagine happening in the future, but um, no, not, I haven't heard any noises yet. Ian at the back. Thanks, Joe. So, quick question on Brown. Um, you know, your sell count, thresholds, and the three sets, and from a Fontura perspective, is 157 around uh, manufacturing efficiency, or is it set around the suppliers uh, you know, getting greater efficiency out of their cows? Yep. And uh, at what point are you effectively transferring costs from the factory on the farm? It, 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 that it is complicated. Um, why 150,000 is a is a really good question, and I haven't seen any kind of really concrete answer that was like this is exactly why. Because there's a whole lot of different things that have kind of fed into it. Some of it is just historical in that NMAC, the National Advisory uh, National Mastitis Advisory Committee, kind of 10 years ago said we should be aiming for 150,000 because at the time that was what the top 25% of farmers were achieving. So it's always been kind of sitting there in everyone's head, oh, 150,000 is a good target. It is a target that's used overseas as well, so it, it kind of aligns with international expectations around what's good and bad from a cell count perspective. Um, some people use that as a threshold between uh, an infected or an uninfected cow from a subclinical mastitis perspective. Um, so, it's, so the number is still there. Um, from a processing perspective, the, I, th I think that's probably slightly higher where they start to run into issues. But um, yeah, there's, there's obviously politics that goes into this around you know, what can farmers achieve, what are the, there are benefits from, a, for an increased production, there are benefits from, a, from, 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 from benefits from increased production on the farm, benefits to increased yield out of the raw milk. Um, I, I think it's one of those you got to draw a line in the sand somewhere, and there were already quite a few lines drawn at that point. So it was um, some of it was that you, you wouldn't want us to then set a different threshold. I think is the is the thing that um, what's the politics of us going? Oh no, we want 130,000, and and how do you how does that square with what's already out there in the market, which is which is saying 150,000 is a good target? Is I think it is a good target. As we keep moving through the day. Um, Remembering that Michael uh, Shellcraft and, and Steve Cranford will be, be with us for the day too. So if there's questions that you haven't been able to ask, you know, as we're heading out to the paddock, get alongside them and ask them. As we come back for lunch, feel free to ask them as well. Um, but I'm just going to take this time now just to talk about one of the other areas of our farm business that we have been working on. And um, this one is about quality workplace. Now, how easy has it been to get great quality staff on farm this year? It's been pretty hard, eh? Um, and our responsibility is to make sure that we are providing attractive, fulfilling workplaces for for people um, to come and join and be a part of our, our story. And so having a quality workplace encompasses um, not just the health and safety of the people, the enjoyment, the growth of them, the way they contribute to our industry, but also how we use technology to help enhance and make that workplace um, less riskier, more consistent and um, of, of higher value to the people that choose to come and work in the deer industry so we can keep them there a whole lot longer. Now, in 2019, um, we actually embarked on a little bit of a journey, which was about understanding where we actually spend our time. So throughout the months of all of July and all of August, um, and I have to take my hat off to the team that was on farm back then, they wrote down every half an hour, or they put into 15 minute blocks what they were doing with their time. So our three team members on farm, every 15 minutes, what exactly they were doing on farm at that time of the year. Now, um, what we were able to do is we repeated that again in 2022. Same thing, um, and we did it for a period during calving, and we did it during a period with mating. And the reason why we did it is because there's always a lot of assumptions about what you're doing on farm. We tend to know roughly what it takes to milk the cows, but we don't often explore all the other things that we are doing on farm. Now, we first used that information from the 2019 data to look at where 
um, continued investment would enhance our workplace. And one of the things that our farmers, that we've been all AI now for, uh, Gee, four, five years now, I suppose? Maybe even six years, eh, Bill? It's been quite a long time. So it's a long, a long period. And so when we started to look at the data, we were able to see that drafting in our shed, which, you know, you see our shed there. She's, a, she's an old girl, but she works well. Uh, we were having to have two people in there, one person who was, of course, um, milking at cups on. We had automatic cup removers, and we also had the auto teat spray, but we had to have an extra person in there at mating who was um, selecting cows, and drafting was quite the process. You put the can on the, on, the, on the platform by the cow that needs drafted, and you stop the platform when it gets over there and set the draft up, and off she goes. Okay, So the, the old tail paint cans were, were, were coming in handy then. Um, what we were able to do is in 20, uh, June 2020, we invested 40k on our ProTrack auto draft system. Um, that was being installed there. And more um, recently, we also used that data to look at the next area of time, which was being spent on uh, moving cows around the farm, and it was also spent on um, putting up fences. And that actually gave us a platform to invest in Halter. So that was a 20k investment in uh, December of 2021, uh, and an ongoing cost of about 40 grand a year with, with virtual fencing with Halter technology. So I just wanted to share a little bit about that data. So it's um, so this is the timesheets that everyone was filling out, and um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the results because uh, some of it's quite interesting, and I'm kind of quite keen to hear about your experiences with technology as well. So remember, we're using data to make an informed choice on where we invest in technology to enhance our workplace. So it's not, um, everybody's workplace is quite different and that's why it's really important to understand your own workplace, where your limitations are and where your opportunities are. So this first set of data, and you'll find this will be in your handout, and this is in page, page number 23. And this is over carving period. So a couple of things to note with the data, it's, it's never exactly um, pure and um, totally 100% uh, I guess totally accurate. The, the two things that we, I just wanted to note is that when we did this in 2019, we did it for an eight week period. There were three team members on farm and what we do is we average out over the eight week period the hours spent combined within a working week. When we did it back in 2022 this year, we did it for a two, and, and sorry, it was all of July and all of August and we started carving on the 7th of July. When we did it again in 2022, we did it for the last couple of weeks of um, August and we started carving on the 1st of, uh, 1st of July. So you can see that the workflow would be slightly different and the time period that we took it was a, sh a shorter snapshot and it was a little bit later into the carving season. So um, there's a couple of things there, I guess, that, that probably um, could, could, I guess, be highlighted. Um, We've got fairly similar times with a lot of things. The, the first one probably is, is if you look down the list, I guess starting at the top using Halter, there's time allocated for using Halter. So when we talk to the team about how the Halter got used, um, the farm manager tends, tended to sit down and do planning with Halter, setting up grazing breaks, um, using the data a little bit more um, uh, to, to plan ahead. The team that's implementing Halter on a day-to-day -day basis never really allocate time to using Halter. And we sort of said, well, why? And that was because they do it when they've got downtime. So they might be sitting there and they drop a fence. They might be sitting there, they put up a fence. Um, they didn't actually think that they were using any extra time to actually use, use the product. Um, and so the hours allocated there is about, it's about two hours or something like that a week on, on using Halter. So that's a, that's a new time that's, that's been spent. Um, a bit more time on Minder. So remember that we're using ProTrack now, it means that we're spending more time loading cows uh, and information via ProTrack. Um, and we're also collecting, uh, transferring our information into Minder. So all our animal health treatments and that are all now in Minder. We're, going to, we're trying to get um, more data at our fingertips, like Michael had mentioned, about each cow so we can make informed decisions about her health, her wellbeing. And we've also got a bit of a, an audit trail any cow we can pull up in the paddock and we understand her mastitis history, um, lameness and all that sort of information can now come through. Feeding out, um, yeah, well, what can we say? This year we were pretty tired of feed this spring, so of course we were feeding out a whole lot more and a whole lot earlier than we would normally do. We normally try and um, feed mainly grass during that, that sort of spring period. 
Um, a couple of things, um, washing down um, has gone up relative, that, that, would, that tends to be more an indication of the fact that we've had those cows were at peak milk during that period when they were measured, whereas um, the, 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 in 2019 it covered that period right from the beginning of July where we would have only had small numbers of cows in there being milked. So, but it is one to look at. So anytime we see this data, we kind of go, oh, that's interesting. Maybe we need to explore that a little bit more. Um, we have, uh, we're redoing the dung buster out there at the moment, and we are doing a project to look at water usage on farm. And within that will be things like washing down and how we clean our shed. Um, interestingly, the break times went up. So that, to me, was a positive. So the team actually had more time for, for longer breaks during the day. Now, the breaks are only recorded if that staff member was working a whole day. So if a staff member did the morning and then went off for the day, they wouldn't have recorded the lunch break. If a staff member wasn't working on that day, they wouldn't record a lunch break, etc. Feeding calves went up because we, were, of course, had more calves in. Calves had been kept on farm for longer. Um, and so during that period, of course, that, that's a, a, a greater time cost to us, uh, even though we have a similar once a day feeding policy with those calves. Uh, getting the cows in was interesting. So the cows getting in during calving actually went up rather than went down. And so we sort of thought with Halter we would probably reduce our time. We found that it, it went up. Um, and it'll be quite interesting when you look at the mating data, there's quite a significant change during times of the season. And uh, a couple of the learnings I think that we've had from that is that when cows go through that springer period where they're not moving to the shed all the time, there is kind of like a retraining once they're back in the colostrum mob where you get them used to the come to the shed routine and you're able to get that movement happening. Once they're, they're trained in that, they then go into their milking herd and then they seem to, um, we seem to be able to make the big gains again once they're in that sort of milking rot routine. So that's a good one to, to know. Um, it's never straight from a springer mob where you've just been shifted from break to break to break and all of a sudden the cow remembers what a come to shed recall is. Um, you do have to make sure you're, you're sort of retraining and supporting those cues. Um, and then, of course, the milking has gone up quite a lot. That's just surely a fact of, of the time of lactation in which we collected the data. But what it has highlighted to me and Steve when we were out in the shed there before is that um, we are going to be looking at um, the um, Milk Smart program for us, um, and we'll be looking at things like our MAC. Uh, max T, so making sure we're not over milking the cows and making sure that we're taking the best possible efficiency route when it comes to milking. Uh, the Farm Insights information from Frontera does show that there's things to be gained for us and so we're looking to explore that one this season for us. So that was calving and then just a quick snapshot on um, mating. <coughs> So this is this main, mainly that period in October, um, fairly similar time frames. I think the October one was, um, it was for a full month in October in 2019, and the October then one that we did in 2022 was the last week of October, first week of November. So a couple of things you'll notice, so AB um, is, is taking, oh, using halter, so a, a lot more time using halter, um, and so that's with, you know, you've got multiple mobs going, a bit more planning, uh, that's up to about five hours a day. Um, with Halter, and the other thing is entering data on cows, they might be changing mobs, you might be doing health treatments, all that sort of stuff. Um, AB has gone down, so that's um, time spent working with the AB technician. The cows are, are normally around in the paddock, it's easy enough to get them in, um, move them through, that stuff seems to happen a whole lot quicker. Um, we've got more time spent um, using Minder for all the reasons I told you before. Um, focus day and tidy up. So you'll notice that there's a big, a big increase on that. The reality is, when you're saving time, um, as well as increasing breaks, which we have done, um, the team actually managed to get in, stuck into a whole lot of other jobs. So um, like I said before, they've been cleaning stuff, we've been doing the cottages, tidying up the grounds, uh, we've been doing all our recycling, so there's been a lot of other things that we do with our time, uh, rather than just not, not work, um, if that sort of makes sense. Uh, getting calves in, um, so that's calves that are out, they come in to be um, weighed, um, we had different mobs weaned at different times in order to, to meet their health targets, so that's gone up a bit. And um, things like weed spraying, which is we're doing more of that because that's, we've got time available to do that. 
couple of things that aren't surprises. Um, mowing has gone down a whole lot, and that's just the fact we didn't have any grass to mow <laughs> compared to the year before. Um, break fences, well, we don't have to put up break fences anymore, so that just disappeared. Um, and this is the time where we were having to put up break fences. So when you want to allocate three quarters of a paddock to get enough grazing pressure, we were having to put up a fence, go down, take, and then go have a look, take it down, put it up somewhere else, shift the cows. So we're starting to see some gains happening here, right? Um, lame cows, that's gone down quite a bit. Um, part, just take that one with a grain of salt because our lame cow numbers are kind of tracking fairly similar to, to the previous year. So partly we're getting more efficient at, at maybe dealing with them and doing it, and partly for the fact that they tend to, with, these, with the cows with white line, put a block on them, they tend to survive and work, work really well within their own herd. So we're not having to run a hospital um, mob for most of the year. The cows seem to... Um, integrate better, they can be managed better um, within, their own, within their own herd. Farm walks are quicker, um, it takes us a whole lot less time, all the data gets processed into halter. Uh, we have a presumed uh, cover before we go into the paddock, which makes um, our process a whole lot quicker and easier to manage. Um, break times has gone up a little bit. Uh, getting the cows in has, or oh, drafting, I better not forget that one. So drafting, we've saved about 19 hours a week in drafting. So in the morning, you just refresh the screen on halter, you pull up the numbers, and this is the bit where, so all those people who are in the LIC here at the moment, you'd make our life a whole lot easier. You've still got to manually enter the data into the ProTrack system to get those cows drafted out. But effectively, one person can run all that, run that whole shed. Cows are drafted out ready for AB in the morning, just like that. So 19 hours a week were saved on their drafting. So that's the investment in 40 grand in ProTrack and then the extra 20 grand plus the halter um, to save that 19 hours, okay? So this is the data that we've got to sort of start to look at a little bit more closely. Um, and then of course, you know, getting the cows in has reduced. The one sticky point that we still do have on farm is two herds coming from two sides. There is a crossover. So Halter will bring them to within about, uh, it's about 100, 150 metres, eh, Bevan, of the shed. And at that point, we still have to have a bit of crossover. So there's a little bit of to and fro -ing. Sometimes the second person might be helping with the crossover. If they don't turn up, you know, the, the milker can do all that sort of stuff by themselves. So that's a, a little bit in a nutshell. So just any questions on, on that bit of information? There's quite a lot of data to, to get through. And like I said, we've only just captured this data. This is fresh, fresh off the press from last week. So it's, it's pretty new to us as well. But it, 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 um, it's a really good starting point. So any, any questions or anybody done any similar analysis of, of their time and task on farm and what technology you invested in? Um, so the only thing I can, t the comparison that I can make based on those two products is that this time last year we were tracking at a 50 hour working week average per person, this time this year we're at 46. So, um, and so the context is that we're targeting a 45 hour working week per person per week over the whole year and traditionally at this time of the year we'd still be almost still peaking because by the time we've got crops in the ground, we're mowing, we've got silage, we're milking cows, we're doing AB, we're still accumulating hours. Um, what we've seen is the trend. So we're shifting a lot of that peak workload from this time of the year um, because what we're finding is that in the summer, we're having to shift, cow um, we've got cows on crops, we're having to feed out a lot more in the summer uh, and that's a bit of a result of our ch changing climate in the, in the Waikato. So that's probably the only piece of data I can tell you comparing those two years. Um, the other thing that's a little bit different is the makeup of our team. So this year, instead of having three FTEs, which we had in 2019, we've had two FTEs plus we've had uh, five um, different people doing milking. So we've got a huge team of relief milkers, some are students, we've got uh, Bevan's wife's been helping out, we've had a whole team. And you imagine how many people are cupping those cows and still to get that result. Um, and we've also had a drive-in um, magic man, who, uh, Magic Mike pretty much, who uh, has been able to do everything on farm. So he comes in and does between about 14 to 20 hours a day with a big long list of work to do and he just flies through it. And so effectively the same FTEs but just dis dis distributed in, a, in quite a different way. 
Um, and we're seeing that rise in what we call gig working, so that's people who are able to come onto farm for short periods of time, and we've been able to really benefit from that um, uh, on our farm and, and sort of adjusting to that. Mm. I know, wonderful, eh? <laughs> and we'll have crops coming out our way, Zoo, <laughs> that we'll have to deal with. Exactly, yeah, which we're really looking forward to. Um, the other thing that I just wanted to talk about with the investment in technology, though, is that um, it's given us a con consistency and flexibility. So, um, and I hope Bevan doesn't mind me using this example, but we come first of September, Bevan jumped on farm, uh, we're right in the middle of uh, getting any things ready for mating and um, crops in the ground, etc. So, so quite a, a, a big transition period. Um, we work, he worked really hard on making sure every cow had the right EID. We worked really hard on making sure the protract drafting was working well. We cleaned up all of our data, all of our technology. Um, we, had, we had plans in place. What happens if your phone breaks? What happens if we drop Wi-Fi? What happens if a cow loses a collar? And we put procedures all around that. Day three into mating, and uh, Bevan goes off, had a stag do he had to go to, which was awesome. Three days away, Jules is running the farm, our farm assistant. And the beautiful thing about that is three days into mating, there was nothing more you could do on farm that day that would enhance the, the result. And that ideally is where we want to get to. No pressure on our key decision makers, that we can still get them off, to, off farm, we can get them rested. But we put, we put protocol in place in different areas. So instead of having a person there looking at the cow who's on heat, we spent all the time making sure the technology was enabled to, do, to be its best. And we weren't looking for faults in it, we were looking to enhance it and getting value from it. And so it's quite a different way of, of thinking and trusting and working with technology, um, but it gives us flexibility. So if two, if two people are on farm on any given day, it makes everybody's day much more enjoyable, but if not, somebody's not there for the day, one person can do the farm in about six hours and it's, it still works, right? And that's effectively how we're trying to manage some of that risk. Yeah, that's that's a great question, but yeah, it sort of comes with probably um, experience. My experience being on farms for probably I was born and bred on the farm, so for 40 years, and you sort of as you, you know, work with people and different abilities, you sort of understand how long things will take. So it's one thing as a manager, you know that um, yeah, if you load up the work, at some of them get um, quite. Um, sort of flustered, so yeah, every individual is a little bit different. But like, um, yeah, Magic Mike that comes in, he, you could give him a whole list of maybe 40 jobs and it wouldn't worry him, he'll just um, knock them out, so. But then you might have another worker, if you load them up on um, work, they'll, um, yeah, just won't be able to cope. So it depends on the, um, yeah, it depends on the individual, but, um, Hopefully that's answered your question. Um, just this last one I wanted to mention. This is Bex, Bex Watson. You may have seen her feature recently, I think, in the Farmers Weekly. Um, she's actually one of our, our team of relief milkers. So she was coming in every Tuesday morning to, to milk, which meant that it gave one of our team <coughs> members are sleeping. Uh, we also have a placement student who does half a day uh, a week throughout the term time and um, she's actually out on farm now with a, a farmer who's in the group with us today. Um, he finished up his term, for his finished school and is now looking for some work prior to Christmas before he goes off to do further study. So along, along with Annex, um, we've also got an ex St Peter's student and we've also got a student who's currently working on a sheep and beef farm who comes in and milks and he's off to Lincoln Uni as well. So um, I guess the, the key thing is that if you think about people like, like Bex um, and even at St Peter's School here, there's 10 curriculum subjects that touch on ag and hort. They're running about 16 classes in the school here. 330 students are studying ag hort. One in every three kids that go through that gate is studying 
something to do with primary industries. There's four teachers here, and this story is not isolated to St Peter's. We've got these students, they're coming through, they want to be a part of our industry, and it's really important that they have um, successful and f fulfilling experiences when they're with us. And I think we're all responsible for understanding a little bit about how we look after these people on farm and we keep them there. And for us, understanding how people are doing things and how we can make their lives easier, safer, and still get a consistent performance response is what our responsibility is as, as farm owners. So I just kind of wanted to, to leave you with that, that picture of Bex. That's our future. That's in 10 years' time. Those are the people that will be running your farms. And um, they're really, really important to our industry. And now's the time that we can embrace technology and make those changes. So this is our journey. Your journey will be quite different. But I just wanted to share the process that we used to make those decisions. OK, so um, just carrying along with our theme around focusing a little bit on what we can control and farm when everything feels a little bit out of control. Uh, we've talked a little bit about our animal health outcomes and what we can do on farm to make sure we're managing the best result both for our cows um, and also for the milk, the quality milk that we are supplying and extracting value from that. Um, we've talked a little bit about how we can invest in technology to make sure we're providing quality workplaces to encourage and retain um, quality staff into. And then the last thing we just want to talk a little bit about is business health. And um, while there's elements of things that are out of control in this space, there are certain, certainly things that we can do to make sure we're minimising our risk or exposure in these areas. So I just wanted to, to talk to you a little bit about some of our results before I bring Joe to talk to, up to talk a little bit about what we're seeing on, on farm inflation and, and what the trends will be going forward. But this is our dairy base figures for 21 and 22. So who here has got their information in dairy base? Awesome, you guys are legends because the more information you put in, um, the better we're able to generate benchmarks and the variety of benchmarks that are available to us. So if you haven't got your information in Dairy Base yet, please please do so. You can see anyone at Dairy NZ who can, where's Frank? So you're there who can help you out with that. Um, one of the interesting things is looking at 2021-22 um, was always going to be a fantastic year. We had a really high payout predicted. We were budgeting on about, I think it was maybe 7 seven fifty. I think even at the time when we set our budgets, it was like six fifty. So there was money to be made. Um, the challenge was holding on to that money. Now, um, we finished up the year with about an extra 100k worth of profit out of that extra payout that we got. And what we were finding is that we were caught in this uh, kind of rat race of increasing uh, inflationary pressure. Every time we bought something, even though our quantities weren't necessarily changing, the cost of them kept going up and up. And what we were finding is that there were certain products which were already brought or already contracted that um, we knew where they were going to land, but there were certainly a lot of products on the market, like things like palm kernel, um, getting people on farm, those sorts of things that we got a little bit out of our control. One of the things that we really look at when it comes to, to profitability, and, and particularly when we think about business resilience, is our profit margin. What we're trying to do is, is we're trying to keep as much of our revenue in our pocket as profit. There's no point making a whole lot of money if we're not able to hold on to that as profit. It just goes out the door as expenses, which is great for our communities. It's great for making sure that there's wealth circulating and in our communities, but um, there's a certain amount of it that we need to make sure we hold on to very tightly to ensure the sustainability of our business. So you'll see that our operating profit margin dropped down from 35.7% in the 2021 year down to 33.2%. Um, so for us, you know, that's a little bit of an alarm bell. We're kind of aiming for between 35 and up to 40 per cent is what our target really is. Um, and so it's made us think quite you know, closely about how we ensure that that extra income coming through in the form of high payouts is actually staying in our pockets. So a couple of other things with um, our dairy base information. <clears throat> when you start to break it down, our operating profit have settled um, only about three or four hundred dollars above the current average. So the average in dairy base changes all the time as more and more people put their information through. Uh, this whiskers, uh, cat, cats and whiskers graph is quite cool because it does actually show what's influencing that op operating profit. A couple of things um, I guess that you'll notice is that last year our production went down to 163,000. We targeted about 175,000 and the year before did about 178,000. So we were having to make the decision during a very, very dry late autumn about how much feed we brought in to keep milking. 
and of course we chose, um, we were also tracking our environmental footprint, greenhouse gases and our nitrogen loss, and we you know, made the decision to, to dry off based on a whole lot of contributing factors. And so um, production, although does kind of move quite a lot during the seasons, um, that does also drive your income per kilo and of course your expenses per kilo because it's one of the the, uh, I guess, denominators in that equation. Um, what you'll notice, though, is that our gross farm revenue per kilo of milk soda was actually quite high, so it's up in that sort of top 25th percentile. We've, our whole strategy at our farm has been about investing in increasing standards, but it's also been about e extracting value from that. And so that whole story about getting highest quality milk is if we're going to provide milk, let's provide the highest quality milk. If we're going to sell calves, let's provide the highest quality calves. Everything we do, we're looking to extract the value because extracting the value allows us to recoup the cost and the investment. The investment's going to have to happen regardless. We need to make sure that we're capturing the value from it. And um, what you'll see is that our operating expenses uh, were sitting slightly higher than the average as well per kilo of milk solid. So part of that is the fact that we weren't able to dilute it over lots of kilos of milk solids, and part of it is that we do continue to invest in things like technology and planting and people um, and animal wellbeing and animal welfare outcomes. Uh, when you look at it over time, um, this would be great if green meant you were winning at anything, but when I look at that, when, that green bar, um, when it's so high and peaking like that, it always just makes me a little bit sad. Um, and what, what we're looking at there is our costs over time. And um, the one highlight out of that whole page is if you look at animal health, you can see that our animal health was the only expense area that, that went down. And I'm sure it's not because the vets aren't charging enough, is it, Bill? <laughs> but our exposure our exposure to the vets charging too much is a whole lot less, right? So once we sort out our animal wellbeing um, uh, you know, issues, predominantly lameness and mastitis, it means that we don't need to invest so much in, in products that uh, are needed to treat them, i.e. antibiotics and things like that. But what we do use is we use our vet to give us information on things like body condition score. We, we get information around what's happening with non-cycling cows. We're actually using our money when we invest in our vet to give us productive outcomes rather than just sort of fixing those cows that might fall off the cliff. So that was the one highlight. But all the rest you'll see, um, the green bar just kept on going going. Up. Now, the, the dip that you'll see between the 2021 and the 2021 22 years is the fact that we haven't got that cost dilution. So, 178 kilos versus 163 kilos. That's why um, you know, you've got quite the scale of it, but it's the trend. The trend is what's important. Every area we pretty much couldn't control the cost. Some of them had quantity increases, like supplements. We brought in extra feed to get through the drought. Some of them were just purely the unit cost of that input, okay? So um, when you get information like this, it's always really interesting to look at, but we always have to go, go to the experts to find out sort of what's happening with this data, what can we learn from it, and how do we move forward with it. So what I want to do is I want to introduce uh, Jo Faber. So Jo jo is one of our valued members in our farm management committee. She's also a senior agribusiness manager, grew up in the, in the Waikato, the mighty Waikato, and um, one thing you might not know about Jo is that she worked as a freshwater restoration scientist. UK, USA and New Zealand, so she's got quite an understanding about um, our businesses and sustainable businesses, um, particularly New Zealand, and so for the last past eight years she's been um, in business and agribusiness banking. Um, so it gives me great pleasure to bring Jo up, who's going to talk a little bit about um, inflation. So, over to you, Jo. Just push that one to go forward. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, so I guess what I wanted to do today was, um, Joe and I had been talking about where things were landing and we were looking at the actual figures versus the budgeted figures and just saying, you know, where's it all going wrong? Um, I guess my first highlight to her was it's, it's not just our farm, it's not anything individual. We're seeing, you know, these sorts of cost inflations across the board with all of our clients. Um, so you'll, you'll hear on the news they talk a lot about the consumer price inflation and that's, that's running at about that 7.2% um, versus what you've got on farm is the rural inflation which is actually just under 14%. Now these, the figures that I'm, I'm guess I'm trying to put some figures around what you're seeing 
um, today. The figures are as at, uh, well actually they're due to be updated by StatsNZ today, so our economists will put something together and sort of show you where it's gone in the last quarter, but essentially of that 13.7% um, that you're seeing in rural, it's not weighted evenly, so you've got um, uh, horticulture down, I say down, they're at the lower end of about 10% inflation, and the majority of of what we're seeing, the inflation is actually coming in on the dairy side of farms, so that's at 15.8% inflation is what, what you'll be seeing. Um, the only, I guess, other camp that's, that's probably worse is that um, uh, uh, the other business, I guess, is the transport industry, and that's running at about 18% inflation, and that's on the back of fuel costs. So, so you, you know, you've got some pretty big numbers here. Um, this is just a graph showing you the weighting of it. So of the 21 expense categories that StatsNZ look at, um, 20 of them have posted price increases. Um, particularly it's that fuel and the fertiliser. One thing to think about this is, is you've got a percentage across the bottom, but if you think about it in dollar terms, whilst it looks, you know, fuel's obviously way along there, um, fuel in a transport business, obviously huge. Um, for, for dairy farmers, you know, that FERT is, whilst it's not the highest percentage in dollar terms, that is, you know, really, really noticeable. Um, what I guess I wanted to show here is where we think it's going to go. Um, and so this sort of near on 14% at the moment, typically inflation is set at about that 1% and 2%. So when we've been doing budgets and clients have brought budgets to us, um, it hasn't you know, it almost hasn't been on the radar. It's been pretty stagnant and, and sat quite nicely at that one and two percent. When we're looking at this, um, there's lots of tools that the Reserve Bank are trying to, to bring this inflation under control, but unfortunately we're not expecting that that's going to be a, a one, one hit wonder and sort of bring everything back under control quickly. So we are expecting some persistence with this inflation. Um, so over 2013, 2014, expecting it to pers persist and not back until sort of 24, 25 to get back to that 1 and 2%. So um, I guess the, the takeout is everybody's in the same boat with it, um, but we are expecting it to last a, a little bit longer. Um, I'm, I guess I'm the bearer of bad news here, and I said to Joe, I hope we're not going to finish on this note. But <laughs> so what um, Joe's going to come and talk to us about now is just, I guess, the the next step of of what you do have control over. This is is out there, you know, as a, an individual farmer, inflation is is an expense that you you have to take. Um, but it's the really what can you do about it stuff that I think is is a focus for yourselves. And uh, yeah, like the doom and gloom, this is our, our cash flow, this is to the end of September. One thing you will notice is the sea of red, so we do variance reporting. Um, this budget was set in March of last year, and at the time, I think we'd put in between about 5 to 7 percent, you know, kind of, uh, we normally run a CPI at about 3 percent, so every year we add 3 percent to our prize um, when we're doing our budgeting. Um, and I just started to get really shaky feet, even by the 1st of June, about how the budget was going to look. And we've just got this continual sea of red. And, and uh, don't feel too comfortable, because even the areas that are green are ones that I know that there's still invoices outstanding or missing. So um, they won't stay green for, for very long. So um, it's a bit of a wake-up call. And the reality is it's, I'd rather know this than not know this, right? Because we're still, it's still, we're still in a position where we can make decisions about it. Let's not hide, hide away from this stuff. So what are we doing about it? So that information that Joe shared about where the cost, where the inflationary pressure is in and the relativity to your business is, is, is pretty important. So um, for us, like fuel's not, not a big thing. Our tractor runs about 500 hours a year. We're not spending a lot of money on fuel. So our exposure to that is relatively low. Somebody who runs a system five who might be using a lot of tractor, a lot of gears, a lot of machinery, that would be an area where they'd start to look at, well, how can they save fuel? How would they um, look at that as a price within their business, right? So the things that we are doing is, once we understand our exposure to inflation, our lease costs of our tractors is 
is a really good example. Um, they've gone up about $1,000 a month. So um, what we've done is we've done two things. One, we're getting rid of one tractor. We've looked at the tractor usage that we've got. We've looked at our, our system, what our system currently needs. And we've also looked at the hours that our tractors are running. And so we can save, um, just by dropping that extra small tractor, we save about nine grand a year in lease costs because our tractors are leased. And we're also looking to purchase our bigger tractor, which um, the lease cost was going to go up to about sixteen fifty a month. Um, we're going to purchase that tractor because we can actually get finance cheaper and pay that tractor off within about four or five years rather than um, continuing to pay a lease on it. So we're starting to look at capital investment versus as cash flow as well. Um, the other thing is we're exploring second year chicory, so we get exposed to fuel, weed, pest and um, seed costs through our cropping program. So we're looking at how chicory performs under a second year just to see if it's viable to keep it as a two year crop rather than having to get it put back into pasture and get new crop in every year. And um, we'll continue to explore opportunities within our forage program as well. The other thing um, that we're looking at is managing our interest rate exposure. So one of our um, advantages, just like every farm has their own advantage, is our proximity to the town boundary. We have um, sold off some of our land. Uh, the first lot of about 18 hectares has already gone into subdivision and there's some more land to go. What we're doing is we're selling off that land and we're using that to, to pay off debt and trying to get our interest rate exposure down. We were sitting at about $1.05 for interest and lease costs. Um, by the time we finish that, that transaction, this is still a bit of a transition year, we'll be dropping that cost out by about 56 cents. So all of a sudden, the pressure on the profit that drops out of our business gets reduced and we have um, a bit more opportunity to sort of weather the storm ahead of us. The land, though, um, is uh, what we'd call terraced land, uh, more unproductive land, so you've got to be really careful about your business. You don't want to sell off prime dairy land. You want to look for opportunity with land that may be better served under uh, pot potentially an another, another enterprise. But that's just, that was our opportunity. Um, other farmers will have different opportunities ahead of them. Um, but that's been one of our strategies. <clears throat> um, the use of last year's profit. So we still cleared 700,000 last year, which is quite a lot of money for a business. We've focused on investing that in areas that we know uh, will give us a bit of sustainability. We've spent quite a lot of money on our houses. Um, we were really lucky to have you know, six years worth of long service from previous employees, but probably what we did do is, is um, maybe not keep up with uh, modern day requirements for housing and the competitive labour market that we were going into. So we've managed to re-carpet, re-drape, um, re-bathroom, uh, re-kitchen um, our units just to make sure that they're set up and ready and attractive and uh, quality homes for our, our new team joining us. The other thing that we are also exploring is our water use. So every year we pay $1.47 per cubic metre of water. Every year our water usage has been going up and up and up and we can also see from our time and task analysis that we've been spending more and more time fixing water leaks on farm. So what we're looking to do is, is invest up to 60 grand over the next couple of years, uh, well over this sort of summer time to upgrade our water supply and that also allows us to meet some of our animal welfare, animal wellbeing outcomes around stock water availability and reliability. Um, and then probably the last one is about preparing for continued future investment. So the idea is to make sure that we're in a position to be able to invest in things um, as we move forward. It's not about battening down the hatches and not spending any money, but it's about prioritising those things that will, will allow us to continue sustainable farming. Uh, for us, we are exploring options around getting uh, methane inhibitors into cows. Um, this summer we'll be getting some Z um, ZD, ZD trial feeders on farm, which are self-dosing feeders that are read by an EID. Uh, we're going to try them in the crops and just see how well that works. Uh, we're just working with um, Dairy and Z on a, a little bit of a plan for that. Um, but it might mean that we have to put um, shed feeders or we might have to have another form of delivery, but somewhere down the track it's quite likely that a methane inhibitor will be part of our future story. We need to make sure we're in a position to be able to invest in that infrastructure. We don't have any feeding, so a farm that has a feed pad or some sort of feeding system, uh, they've already done that investment, so they'll be fine. But for us, it's one of those things for our farm that we need to make sure we've got on our horizon. And the other one is, of course, the shed. We need a shed to milk cows. That shed's got about 10 years' worth of life left in it, so we need to make sure we're planning for that as well and what, what the future shed might look like, where robotics will be a part of that and um, what that technology will look like in 10 years' time as well. 
So it's not all doom and gloom. There is lots of potential ahead for our businesses. Hey, we've got, we've got beautiful, healthy cows out there. We've got wonderful people that want to come into our industry. And we've got businesses that we've still got levers to pull to make sure that we've got um, a good bottom line and that we've got a, a pathway to a sustainable, um, progressive um, business that will be um, of value to the industry. So there's lots of positive things that are, that are still ahead of us. But know your numbers. The one thing that we do do here at our farm is we use data to make informed decisions and then we partner. We partner with our people who are experts in their field and we get as much information as we can out of them. And they're all there for you. All of you can access these people. Um, and you know, you've got people like S Steve, we've got people like Michael who is here, we've got Joe, um, we've got our wider team around us that are all giving us um, informed decisions because we ask the questions. So um, yeah, I guess that's probably my key take home point. Use the information, make informed decisions for your business, um, and then use the experts around you to help you out. So thank you all for your time. Thank you to all our presenters and speakers that were here today. Um, our next focus day is on the 23rd of, of March. So we hope to see some of you there um, at, our, at our next day. The thing that on the 23rd of March, we'll actually be talking about the information that's come out of the greenhouse gas studies. We know how much carbon we're removing with our summer cropping program and we've got the team from Waikato Uni who are going to talk a little bit about farming, farming systems and its impact on soil carbon. And for those of you who were at the um, webinar that was on last night, wasn't it Frank, uh, with Louis Shipper, you'll all understand how um, valuable our, this, this rich resource of soil is on our farm and how we can look to explore ways to make sure we're enhancing and adding value to it. Uh, the other thing is that at the field days we'll be at the Westpac stand, so thanks to, to Mark and the Westpac team, our, our farm will be there with our um, team of representatives, so if you want to catch up with us, come and see, find us at the, the Westpac tent as well. And you're always welcome to come to our Tuesday open days, our farm walks, if you want to chat with me and Bevan, um, or um, soon will be Anthony when he starts on farm, you're always welcome to come and join us, just flick us a text and we can make sure we make, make uh, room for you on the day.